Welcome back to Red Heart Town and uh, the village where we've been staying for a while. You can see things are really starting to get green here in the fields. The weed is growing. Um, maybe I can find a rice paddy while I'm out so we can have a look and see how that's coming along. But uh, yeah, Red Heart Town. I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Somebody uh, asked if that was what I was saying. Yes, Hongxing Town. It means Red Heart. Um, I don't know the history of how that name came to be, but something tells me it's related to communism and the Cultural Revolution. So, there's not exactly a Wikipedia page about uh, about the place, so well, maybe I can author one, you know? <laughs> Red Heart Town, yes. And like I said, I'm pretty pretty sure that the name has something to do with communism and the, uh, they probably came up with it during the Cultural Revolution. So news uh, regarding the virus situation. Um, it's my understanding that things have been reduced in most of China to the point where now one of their new cases that's being reported is actually an imported case from outside of China. So now things have, uh, yeah, the wave has really, really moved on. So I'm hearing about uh, people spreading the virus coming out of Italy to other countries. Um, the United States is starting to get some uh, local cases. Just, uh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it sounds like it's starting to take hold in other places. Maybe you're asking, you know, well, probably not. But is it safe to come to China again? Um, I don't know. Is it safe to go anywhere? I don't know. It sounds like travel in general is probably not a good idea at this time. Because, well... Uh, you never uh, airports and train stations and those sorts of things tend to have people from all over the place so you never know what you're uh, exposing yourself to I wish I could say that things were perfect and back to normal but uh, apparently not not so and I'm looking at uh, my business situation here <laughs> it may be months before things really get back up and going so I don't know I I guess I get to just uh, stay put for the most part and wait it out. So, not looking good for me, not looking good for a lot of people. I mean, I'll be fine. I, I've, I've mentioned that before in other videos. I'm, my business will be fine eventually. And I'm not going to like run out of money or something, but uh, ah, still frustrating. Um, but yeah, within China... Maybe it's a little safer to travel around than other places right now, but yeah, be careful. Like I said, one of the cases that got reported, the few, outside of Hubei province, that is, they're still having problems. It was an imported case. It came across the border from Hong Kong, so. Into Shenzhen, another one of my favorite cities, by the way. I don't know if I've talked a lot about it in any of my videos, but if you're into tech stuff, that's an amazing place to go. Um, I don't know that there's there's not really much tourism there. It's right across the border from Hong Kong, which is nice. But uh, if you're a tech person, I guess that's a, t a tourist thing anyway. So, yeah, go there. Get all your cool stuff. Upgrade your iPhone. <laughs> yeah, lots of fun stuff. Maybe some of you are wondering why I'm not in my car today. Well, my wife complained at me. She said, you know, I'm driving around too much, so... <laughs> Today I'm back out in the fields walking around. Uh, before long, I'm going to end up having to go back to the city. Uh, like I said, I've still got to try and do something with my business. I don't like uh, I don't like waiting around. Um, every day things aren't happening. I feel like you know, it's uh, it's shrinking. That's how I feel. I don't want that to happen. So before long, we're going to have to go do something about it. Um, Probably in the next few days. So there'll be plenty of time in the car. I can put on some more Chinese tunes. That sort of thing. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So for now, though, for the next few days anyway, I'm, I'm back out here in the countryside, walking through the fields. Now, just in case you were wondering, um, China's uh, production capacity, as it stands right now, I believe, as I'm making this last thing I read anyway, 
Uh, China's production capacity is only at 20% right now, so it's probably going to be some disruptions in supply chain. I don't know how that's going to affect things going forward. It may scare some companies, some uh, foreign companies, foreign for me because I'm in China. And they may change things a little bit. So that's the thing that I was worried about when this all started. That, uh, well, it might be really bad for the Chinese economy. Not just because small businesses will close, but also because big businesses will pull out and they'll move their production elsewhere. Or if they were already in the process of doing so, they may uh, speed things along. So yeah, maybe uh, before long, instead of Shenzhen and Guangzhou... It'll be uh, Ho Chi Minh City and Sai... Well, not Saigon. That, that is Ho Chi Minh City, I believe. But uh, Hanoi. So, in uh, Vietnam, if you're wondering. A lot of... Uh, it, well, I hear a lot of things. Uh, it sounds like a lot of tech stuff is moving that way. I'm sure a lot of other things... I, I don't know. China's built up. It's uh, pretty well set up to, uh, to make things. But, you know, again, these, uh, these types of disruptions, I'm sure they, uh, they rattle companies. It's costing a lot of money. Uh, it's not just that, it's also the ports. And, wow, I've managed to find a big mud pit every time. Always, you can have a look here. Ooh. Not fun to be walking through. Let's see if I can get off to the side. Oh, nope. <laughs> right into the mud. Oh, and it doesn't get any better. Oh, boy. I should have just turned around. I'm going to push through. I'm not going to give up. All right, I got through that mud pit. As you can see, there's still more mud to come, but not nearly as bad as uh, what I just went through. So I should be fine. Hopefully I can get this mud scraped off my shoes at some point. But uh, let's see, where was I? Yeah, Vietnam. I, uh, I really think that's probably going to be a big upcoming place. For uh, manufacturing and that sort of thing might be a good time to start thinking about Vietnam as strange as that is of course with this virus thing it's probably not a good time to go to Vietnam in fact uh, I don't think I can go at all because well I'm in China and uh, they're not taking anybody that's been in China so I'd have to wait I'd have to go to a third country give it enough time and then maybe I can go. But, uh, really, why am I going? Oh, I know why I'd go there. They have Slurpees. Well, not Slurpees, but uh, similar. You know the icy drinks you can get at Circle K if you're in the U U.S. and you've ever been to a Circle K. They have a drink that's similar to a Slurpee. Well, guess what? They've got it in Vietnam. So, I know I mentioned Slurpees here in China. They don't have them. But if you go to Vietnam, you can get it. Fantastic stuff. Of course, you might get run over by a motorcycle or something right after you got your uh, icy drink or whatever they call them, um, which would be unfortunate, but uh, that's the way it is. <laughs> the roads are pretty crazy. Vietnam is, uh, yeah, as crazy as the roads are in China, they have nothing on Vietnam. That place uh, apparently is, is nuts. Lots of motorcycles. I, I've heard um, it's basically like China in the 1980s. That's the way I've heard it described. Yeah, interesting place. But warm, it's nice and warm there. Maybe too warm. Maybe if I went there from here after being in all this cold, it would be like, uh, it would be miserable. It would probably just be miserable <laughs> at first. And then who knows, maybe I'd get coronavirus. That'd be a mistake. You know, I can see, like right below me here is a rice paddy. You can see it's uh, flooded and full of mud. Um... But I don't see them really doing much with them. Uh, I, I'm going to have to look it up and see when the uh, the proper time is for planting the rice or doing it however they do it. I don't know. Get in the mud and put stalks of rice in there. Uh, I don't know. They don't seem to be doing that just yet. I'll have to look it up. And yes, I'm in the mud. I should have expected this. I'm in a, on this big embankment. I'm between this uh, small reservoir and a rice paddy, which is normally full of water anyway. So you can imagine the big thing between it that's made out of dirt is probably just a bunch of mud, and it is. <laughs> I'm walking through it. So if I look like I'm having trouble walking, that's why. It's because I decided to walk out through the mud. 
You know, speaking of motorcycles, it reminds me of an experience I had, I guess it was back in 2007. So, the, you know, they have normal taxis, and I mentioned a taxi uh, yesterday, but they also have these, uh, a lot of the foreigners will call it like a motorcycle taxi. It's not a motorcycle taxi. That's actually a thing, or at least it used to be, <laughs> motorcycle taxi. Um, basically, it's like if you took the front of the motorcycle, added uh, two wheels in the back, and put like a, a cab on it. I don't know if I can even find a picture of that, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, it's got like a little bench in the back. Anyway, you know, I've always thought like, okay, maybe two people could fit in the thing or whatever. You know, you might be able to squeeze three people. One day, I saw this, uh, this motorcycle taxi, as I call it. It pulls up, and I see a girl get out and start paying the guy in the front. And next thing I know, like another one gets out, another girl gets out, and another one gets out. And before I knew it, it's like six people get out of this little thing that I think, you know... Only maybe uh, three people could squash themselves into, but now they'll fit. They'll fit if they can. It makes me think of another experience I had with trying to wait for the bus again back in 2007. That was a fun experience. So I was with a friend. We're waiting for a bus, and I see boy, this bird's going nuts again. <laughs> last time somebody commented about a bird going nuts in one of my not last time, but in one of my previous videos. Uh, kind of like this bird a bird was going nuts I didn't hear it because I had my headphones on and they block out pretty much all the sound and uh, yeah it's just one of these birds going nuts it's got a nest over here it probably thinks I'm coming to take it the eggs or something I don't know so it's circling around me making a bunch of noise I don't even know what kind of bird it is but uh, an annoying bird that's what it is anyway so I'm with my friend, we're waiting for the bus, and I see, you know, several normal buses go by, and I'm thinking, like, hey, is it that bus? I'm like, no, not that bus. I'm like, okay, keep waiting. Another bus comes. Oh, is it this one? No, it's not that bus either. Okay, keep waiting. The next thing I know, this, uh, I call it, it's a micro van. If you've been to Japan, you know what I'm talking about. It's like if you took a minivan, and then you shrunk it down to about half the size of that, and yeah that's that's what pulls up and they open the door and the friend is like oh it, this is the bus <laughs> I'm like, this is the bus and you know i get in there's a bunch of people tons of people in this uh, little micro van thing and my friend pays the driver get on and you know there's no seats i'm like okay what am i supposed to do they pulled out this little wooden like stool so yeah, I got to sit in this little stool, and I'm thinking, the thing is full, there's no seats, I'm sitting on a stool, you know, this is crazy, this isn't a bus, but uh, they kept continuing to stop and filling the thing up with people, it was uh, quite an experience, yeah, the, uh, the smallest bus I've ever been on. I'm trying to think of where that was, I, I want to say that was in uh, Georgiang province, it was probably somewhere out by Iwu which I mentioned in another video, is a fantastic place to go if you want to do, uh, I guess, trade, if you want to buy a bunch of random stuff. Not random, I mean, they have everything you can possibly think of, you know, even down to, like, toilet paper and toothbrushes, but meant for uh, large wholesale-type things. So, I don't know, if you have an online business, if you have a store, a shop, I guess you could go there. Electronics, anything you can think of, they've got and they'll ship it to you in whatever country they know how it works they know all the taxes the yeah it's a good place to go if you do that there's a lot of people from like saudi arabia that go there and buy stuff to ship back home to sell so yeah it's a good place for that i don't know if a lot of americans go there but uh hey if you've got a shop if you want to sell things online i guess it's a fantastic place to go I recommend it. I liked it when I was there. That was a long time ago. I'm going to have to make a trip when this is all over. I keep mentioning that. You know, I'm curious uh, if anyone out there is seeing any shortages in stores, not because people are making a run on the store, but because of uh, things not coming in from China. I know, like I said, uh, production is down to about 20% and probably won't be back to normal for a while. 
some of the heaviest hit areas are where they make a lot of things. So I'm curious, you know, has Apple started to experience anything? If anybody's been to an Apple store, do they still have plenty of iPhones? Are they short on things? I don't know. It's hard for me to tell. I hear things in the news and I, uh, I have to wonder. I, I, I don't know if it's hit the stores yet or if it's still uh, at the warehouse level. I don't know. But uh, it's my understanding that there's going to be some shortages because of supply problems. Um, like I said, I hear things in the news, but I don't know. You can't always go. The news tends to make things out outrageous, you know, like, oh, the world's coming to an end. And really, it's not. I mean, <laughs> I've been stuck in the middle of this thing. And as far as I know, I didn't get the virus. So I know it sounds scary. And they're trying to, like, lock off uh, Italy. And to be honest, that's just, you know, that's panic. I don't know. Most of China, you look at the numbers again, you know, and I've talked about this before in other videos. It's, I mean, it's, it's terrible, the, the virus, and it's scary, but really when you look at the numbers and you consider, you know, the population of the planet, it's not as bad as what they're making. I mean, that's how the news works, I guess. They have to make everything outrageous. They have to make it scary because then people will watch. And I'm getting myself further and further into mud. You can see, this is what I'm walking on. <laughs> I've gotten off the road, and now I'm uh, I'm literally just walking between the rice paddies, which probably wasn't a good idea. But, uh, well, here I am anyway. So I guess I'm going to keep walking on this uh, raised area of mud, and hopefully, if you can see... I don't find like some random pit in this uh, this grass or wheat or whatever that's laying down on the th top of the thing. I've done that before. That's not a fun experience, falling in the mud. Oh, here's a little gap. You can see uh, how this works. They'll fill up this one that's up higher. Then it'll go through this uh, little gap here and flow down to the one below it and then the one below it. So I don't know how easy it is to tell. But uh, each one going in that direction is a little higher up than the next the one in front of it. That way, they uh, that's how the irrigation works. Flood one, it moves down to the next and the next until they're finally all flooded. And they have been uh, running the water through here for, I guess, at least a week or two, filling up these rice paddies. So maybe that answers my question from earlier, you know, about the the planting of the rice. They're just waiting for the rice paddies to fill up and for the mud to get soft enough. Then next thing you know, there'll be some uh, water buffalo in here walking around. They'll tie them up to some kind of a something and they'll just go around in these rice paddies doing whatever they do. I guess fertilizing the thing. I don't know. Not sure exactly. I have to tell my wife to share a story because, you know, she, she grew up in China. She's had a very different experience than me. She can tell you about the water buffalo. <laughs> now, they're, uh, yeah, they like water. I'll just say that. And if somebody happens to be riding on a water buffalo, well, if they see water, guess what? You're going in the water. So, they're interesting animals. I remember uh, when I first came to China, a lot of times I'd think I was eating beef, or they'd say it was beef and it was actually water buffalo. I don't know that that's a, necessarily a bad thing. It was just interesting eating water buffalo. It was something I never had before coming to China. So, yeah, water buffalo. And I found a sort of road here that I've come out on. Uh, again, everything is kind of flooded because of this, uh, what they're doing here with the, the rice paddies. So I don't know that this is the best place for me to be walking. And I don't know if it's actually going to go anywhere. But for the moment, I'm not... Uh, just on the raised area between the rice paddies. Maybe the raised area was better than this anyway. This is pretty muddy. I don't know. I seem to have just found my way to more mud, as you can see. Oh, that's my camera. And uh, a very small village, smaller than the one that I have been at. Let's see if I can get through this mud. 
and if uh, this can actually go out somewhere. Yep, sinking into the mud. How pleasant is that? All of it is sticking to my shoes. Well, here's a little road. Maybe this goes out to the main road. The main road. The, uh, the concrete road that goes toward town. Maybe I can walk out to town today. That'd be something. I've got this little app in my phone. It tracks how many steps I take. And uh, you get on this list with all the people on WeChat, which is a Chinese social media type thing and payment thing and everything thing. And it compares you to all the other people on your uh, contacts list. Maybe I can get somewhere above like 64, 64th place. I used to always be, you know, maybe uh, second, anywhere in the top 10. But since this thing has happened... Believe it or not, even with me walking around in the fields, I've been, uh, well, okay, at first, when nobody could go anywhere, I was always, like, number one. Now that people are starting to be able to come out, 64, you know, somewhere around that range, <laughs> that's what it was last night, 64th place. So, hey, maybe if I walk to town, I can be somewhere a little higher, maybe somewhere around 30th place, I don't know. I used to walk a lot more when I was in the city. Out here... There's only so many places to go, only so much to see. Um, even you guys are probably getting bored of seeing these fields. You're like, oh, that's the same rice paddy again. Can't you at least go to a different rice paddy? Nah, uh, maybe I could find a different rice paddy. I can't really tell the difference between them. <laughs> so, I don't know. Rice paddy's a rice paddy. How many of them you need to see? I'm just joking, of course. I don't discriminate against rice patties. They're all different and unique. They're all, yeah. <laughs> now look behind me. There's the concrete road. So I did indeed manage to find my way through the rice patties to the road that goes to town. So maybe I can get myself somewhere up there on that list. We'll see. Tomorrow, I'll let you guys know <laughs> what place I take. I'm hoping for something better. Speaking of these apps, including WeChat, it's really an amazing thing to have. Um, you can use it to pay for things. And in China, people, I mean, I almost never carry cash because I, I don't have to use the phone to, uh, to pay for everything. So cash is almost inconvenient because you have to wait for, you know, change. Oh, we got another one of these, uh, these birds trying to defend its nest. Come on, I don't really care about your nest. I'm not after the, the eggs are too small. <laughs> anyway, yeah, um, I almost never carry cash. Uh, it, it's crazy just how, uh, how these sorts of things have saturated the market out here. If you're going along and there's a beggar, let's say, on the street, and I've had this experience personally, so... What, uh, what happened was this guy comes up, you know, he's asking for money. I don't have any change, so I'm just telling him I don't have any change, you know. And the guy uh, pulls the smartphone out, opens up WeChat and points at it, and it's like, ah, <laughs> okay, I'll transfer you some money. So, yeah, it's to that point. And, yes, even the homeless people have a smartphone in China. Everybody's got a smartphone. It's... Uh, it's really crazy. I mean, everybody that has a phone has a smartphone, but you know, you have to see. They, uh, I again, I've talked about this in another video. I wish that they had this back in the United States, that anybody on any budget can get a smartphone that'll actually work, and you can put apps on it, and it'll do what you need to do. It might not be like an amazing gaming phone or something, which is strange to me anyway. You know, playing games on phones. Uh, yeah, of course, I'm, I'm getting a little bit older, I suppose. I don't know, I remember uh, when a 486 computer, and somebody, a lot of you listening to this will probably be like, what the heck is a 486? Well, when I was a kid, the 486 computer was amazing. My friend had got one, and I, I remember playing SimCity 2000 and all these things on there. Really amazing. And now, smartphones, things that people hold in their hands are, you know, well above and beyond what that was capable of doing. It's kind of funny to me to think about. But, uh, yeah, any budget, you can get a smartphone out here. And, again, I wish that they had that in the United States, but, of course, they, uh, they don't. At least they didn't when I was there. Um, 
if you want to get a smartphone, it's either going to be total junk and falling apart in your hand or else, you know, it's going to be super expensive and those are your two options. But uh, out here, they have every sort of thing in between. You can get something really cheap and even the cheapest phones don't necessarily feel like they're just going to fall apart in your hand. They'll hold up pretty well, but uh, yeah, you can get every everything in between. And sometimes the mid-range phones, I mean, you can get them with, if you like really nice cameras, they'll have a really nice camera on them and still not cost you a ton of money. So yeah, Chinese phones, they're, uh, they're really something. And not all of them are like Huawei, you know, where everybody's afraid they're spying on you or whatever. They're part of the Chinese military, which I don't know if they're really part of the Chinese military directly, but uh, either way, if you want to avoid Huawei, you certainly can. They have Xiaomi and there's, well, there's a bunch of them. And yeah, they make some really good phones, Vivo, that sort of thing. All different ranges of phones. Definitely uh, wish they had that back in the States. You know, it's interesting. Uh, rice out here is so much better than uh, what you get back in the States and probably in other parts of the world. Thailand makes really good rice. You could buy Thai rice back in the States and it would taste pretty good. But uh, I remember one time I bought this, uh, it said it was California organic rice, jasmine rice or something. I got it. It tasted awful. And I always wondered, you know, why is that? Why can't uh, they grow good rice in America? But out here, you know, any farmer just with some mud can seem to grow fantastic rice. I still don't have the answer to that, by the way. But uh, maybe somebody else knows. I don't know. No, oh, I said it again. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> somebody commented on that. I say, I don't know too much. That's because I really don't know a lot of things. I'm, uh, I'm an idiot, remember? Don't be an idiot like me in most cases. Yeah, rice. Why does it taste better? I'm going to have to look that up. I may, is it something to do with the soil? Is it because it's a more labor-intensive crop and Americans generally just have giant, huge industrial farms? I'll have to find out. That's an interesting question that I just asked myself. <laughs> That's what happens when you walk around with a camera. You end up asking yourself questions that then have to be answered. So now I'm going to have to do some work when I get back and look it up online. Why does rice taste better from Asia than it does from America? Could just be that they, you know, Americans don't know how to grow rice. I don't know. Ah, I said it again. If you look behind me, I'm just about into the town. It's kind of funny. The last time I uh, walked down here, I was pretty worried about getting harassed by the uh, local town authorities because they were still keeping everybody inside. But today I don't have to worry so much. So I can record and I can talk as loud as, well, I probably shouldn't talk as loud as I want. That might bother people, but it is fun coming into town. I can smell all kinds of good food cooking. You'd have to, uh, I guess you can't smell the food, but <laughs> Chinese food, some of it is so good. Um, and you can smell it cooking everywhere. Sometimes it's not so good. At least I think so. There's uh, sesame oil is something I'm not a big fan of. And a lot of people use that to cook things. They fry a lot of food out here. It's not fried the same way as, you know, like deep fried or something. But wok fried, I guess you'd say. Everybody cooks with a wok. You, uh, yeah. Like at the Chinese restaurant, maybe not quite as big as the ones they have at Chinese restaurants back where you're from, but, uh, oh, that sesame oil. I hate the smell. I hate the taste. Somebody else might like it, but for me, not so much. It's really too bad. There's not any shops on this end of the town. So nowhere to buy a Coca-Cola, nowhere to buy coffee. Got to walk a long way to get to the supermarket. Well, I guess it's not that far. Uh, it was relatively far. Back in the city, of course, it's just maybe, you know, five minutes walk and you're to a supermarket or something. But in here, it's a little further, which is why the car is nice to have if you're outside of the city. Same as in the United States or anywhere else. No shops, but they do have an auto shop. You get your oil changed. Car wash, apparently. These guys out working. 
I don't go to this one. I go to one in Feng Yang, uh, usually when I'm out here. Because we know the people, not because these guys are like bad or something, but always good to stick with your friends, right? Spoke too soon. Right after the car shop, there's a little convenience store where I was able to get some Sprite. Chinese Sprite. <laughs> now, I think I mentioned uh, Coca-Cola here in China tastes different than the American Coca-Cola. It's very close to the flavor, but um, somehow it's... I don't even know how to... Like, it, it tastes maybe a little bit... Did I say I... Oh, does that count? I guess that's going to have to count. Well, anyway... It tastes different. It has a more sour flavor, I would say. Very slight. It's so close that it's... But it's just slightly different. Sprite tastes... I No, it tastes a little different, too. It's a little sweeter, I want to say. Maybe it tastes more like... Uh, oh, I know why. It's because they use real sugar. They don't use uh, whatever that high fructose corn syrup or whatever the chemical stuff they is that they, they put in the uh, American Sprite these days. I was going to say this tastes a little bit more like uh, Sprite tasted when I was a kid. That's how I'd say. Coca-Cola is different. Pepsi tastes pretty much identical to what it tastes like in America. So if you're a Pepsi lover, then you're in good luck. Um, if you come to China, I mean. Coca-Cola, who knows? Maybe you'll like the, uh, the Chinese Coke better. Probably not, but uh, it's close enough. Sprite, you'll probably like it, or you'll think it's too sweet. I don't know. Oh, I said it again. Oh man, how many times is that anyway? I guess I'll find out when I put this together. Of course, you have to be careful when it comes to Coca-Cola because they like to put different flavors. So in the United States, I know, you know they've got vanilla Coke and there's cherry Coke, which is really good. But here they have those things too. You can get vanilla Coke and it tastes good. And sometimes you can find cherry Coke. But one time I was uh, in Shenzhen and I was at the border crossing with Hong Kong and I saw what I thought was vanilla Coke. So I grabbed it because it was hot and I wanted something cold to drink. And I bought it and I opened it after a little bit and I went to drink it and something was horribly wrong because the Coca-Cola tasted like it had dish soap in it. I'm like, oh, you know, very uh, shocked reaction. And I look at it and surprise, it is not vanilla Coke. It is ginger Coca-Cola, <laughs> which is awful beyond belief, in my opinion. Maybe Chinese people like it. I, I don't think they do because I've seen them react the same way to it. I don't know what Coca-Cola was thinking with that one, you know. Oh, that that can't count, can it? I guess it still has to count. Uh, anyway, yeah, Ginger Coke. I don't know what others they have, but I've learned to kind of avoid some of the other flavors because, well, that was a bad enough experience. Pepsi doesn't do that. Pepsi, no, no, I take that back. If you get the uh, the sugar-free Pepsi, they have one that's like, um, what is it? Oh, it's a caramel-flavored Pepsi. Now, Pepsi is already extremely sweet to begin with. Then make it with caramel, and it's supposed to be sugar-free. But instead, it tastes so ridiculously sweet, which, I don't know, maybe that's... Oh, I said it again with something that's supposed to be sugar-free and normally doesn't taste good, I guess that's a good thing if it's really, really sweet. To me, it was too sweet. Even though it didn't have sugar, it was sweet enough that it made me feel like, oh, I don't really want to drink to this. But yeah, different flavors of soda. Now, I can't mention the strange flavors of Coca-Cola and Pepsi without mentioning the strange flavors of Sprite as well. In Europe, I don't think they have this. I've They have a lot of different flavors in Europe, too, but I never saw this. Uh, one day, while shopping in uh, Beijing, I saw some Sprite on the shelf, and it was blue. I thought, oh, that's strange. So I looked at it, and it's peppermint Sprite. I thought, wow, that's, that's different. I've never seen that before. So I got it just to have, you know, for the novelty of it. 
and I tasted it. To this day, I still don't know if if I like it or if I don't like it. It's it's tolerable, but it's just really strange. It really tastes like Sprite with peppermint in it. Like if you took a peppermint candy and mashed it up and somehow got it to mix into the drink, that's what it would taste like. Now that I've been talking about all these strange snacks and drinks, I really am going to have to make a video where we just get a bunch of these strange snacks that I've talked about and drinks, put them together on the table, and my wife and I will taste them and let you know which ones we think are good and which ones are bad. It'll be interesting to see the difference between her palate and mine as to what uh, what is good and what is not. Um, yeah, it'll be kind of fun. I already know, well, I've grown accustomed to it. Like in the United States, she would, uh, pizza, she likes spicy things. And I, I like spicy things too, but she especially likes to have peppers on pizza. So lots and lots of jalapeno peppers. She doesn't like the banana pepper things, the yellow ones, but jalapeno peppers she loves. So I haven't had a pizza in a long time that wasn't totally covered with jalapeno peppers. For me, I'll eat almost any kind of pizza, to be honest. Except for the ones they have here, which I believe I mentioned in a previous video. But I'm pretty sure most people probably haven't seen that, so maybe I can tell you about it. The uh, It happened in Hefei. I think I've had this experience so many times. I went to a supermarket. Was it in Beijing? Well, it's been so long, I can't remember. But anyway, I went into the supermarket. And they had this amazing looking pizza, except for the fact that it had corn on it, which is really strange. That should have been a warning immediately. You know, hey, pizza shouldn't have corn on it. If you come from a place where they have pizza with corn on it, well, maybe to you that's good, but to an American, <laughs> that seems a little bit strange to have corn on, on a pizza. It had all this cheese and all this stuff. It looked amazing. So I thought, ah, I'll get it. How bad could it be? I'm, I'm hungry. It's lunchtime. So I got this thing. I go out into a park, sit down on a bench, get this slice of this amazing pizza out, and I go to bite into it. And if you remember, I mentioned it was covered with all this cheese. Well, it, it wasn't cheese. It wasn't cheese at all. It was mayonnaise. It was loaded with tons and tons of mayonnaise. And, you know, to make matters worse, the mayonnaise wasn't like, you know, you put mayonnaise on a sandwich or whatever. It was sweet mayonnaise, like they have in Japan. Everything, oh, it was it was so terrible. It, I, I couldn't eat it. The first bite, it was just so disgusting. Thick, thick mayonnaise. We're talking, you know, let me hold on to this. Like this thick of mayonnaise. I don't know how they got it to stay. It was just terrible. It wasn't good. So be careful. If you come to China and you're in the supermarket, they'll have really good stuff that they're cooking in there. You know, these uh, things called baozi. I like them when they fry them on the bottom. They're really good. But if you see pizza at the supermarket, and it's been my experience every single time that I've seen it and tried it, it's the same. It's mayonnaise stuff. Don't get that. Unless you like that. I mean, it's my understanding in Japan, people really like mayonnaise. So, I don't know, maybe if you think, oh, sweet mayonnaise with corn and strange ham and, you know, tomato sauce. That sounds delicious. If it does, then I guess you can go for it. But uh, for me, it was not a good experience. You know, while I'm thinking about it, I just uh, remembered something very funny. Uh, since we're so close to Chinese New Year, well, we're past it. This year will be like the uh, the year where Spring Festival never actually happened, but... Anyway, during the uh, spring festival time, there is this fun little thing that uh, Chinese people like to do, which will show you how creative they are and how much they love to gamble. So in WeChat, <clears throat> if you're in a group, oh, I guess I have to preface this a little bit. So in uh, around Chinese New Year, it is traditional to give as a gift a red envelope with money in it. You give it to kids, you give it to your parents, you give it to whomever, and that's what you do. So on WeChat, you can send a little red envelope thing to a group, and when people click on it, it gives them money. And you can randomize how much money gets, uh, you know, it gets sent when you send it. So you can divide it up. Let's say uh, I send it to the group, and I say, okay, I'm going to divide it up eight times. So eight people can click on it, 
and each person gets a random amount of money depending on how much I sent. Now Chinese people took that uh, that thing and they decided to turn it into a way to gamble as a game during the new year. So what you do is you send it to the group, everybody clicks on it, and whoever got the lowest amount is the loser, and then they have to send the next red envelope. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, I did okay up until I started losing, and then it was like every single time I was the lowest amount, so I uh, I was up for a bit. We're just talking a little bit of money. We're not talking like, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars, which I guess you could do that. And there are probably people in China, rich people that do that. But uh, for us, it was just, you know, the cousins and everybody playing the game. Anyway, I ended up losing 50 RMB, which isn't much when you think about it. 100 RMB is uh, 15 bucks, so maybe somewhere around $7. I don't know. Not bad. But, uh, yeah, it's a fun little game you can play on uh, on WeChat that Chinese people invented. Like I said, they love gambling. They're very inventive. And you put those two things together, and you get the red envelope gambling game in WeChat groups. Well, my wife is calling me and saying it's time to go back and eat. So I guess I better end the video here. I'll get back and put it all together, after eating, of course. And until next time, we'll see ya.